multiple occasions throughout this series I've made references to and done videos on the Fisa Foca War, the more recent FIA photo dispute, which doesn't sound as cool as the Fisa Foca War, and what is more commonly known as the Split, the American Open Wheel Racing Civil War. A lot of wars in motorsport. And while the split is a massive part of modern racing history, given how it set the American Open Wheel Racing Series back at least 20 years, only to end up being how it was before it all split apart pretty much, it also serves as a warning from history. But in the last video on the FIA photo dispute, it didn't stop others attempting the same thing for a variety of reasons. A comment on the last video detailed a potential breakaway in NASCAR as well. There was also something similar happening in the world of motorbikes between FIM and another group. Anyway. Basically, the whole thing just boils down to money, or in the case of the American Open Wheel Civil War, it was national pride, although it was other things on top of that. But I've also made fleeting references to Live Golf, which recently started happening in the world of well, golf, the European Super League in football, and I guess the Premier League can be lumped in with that as well, as that was a breakaway league designed to take full advantage of TV money. But in the 1970s, a man called Dan Gurney had a really good idea that wasn't so much about money and personal gain or anything like that. It was all about everybody's interests, really. So, we'll start with who Dan Gurney was. Dan Gurney was one of the big three of the owner-drivers in Formula 1 of the 1960s, along with Bruce McLaren and Jack Brabham. Yes, John Surtees and Graham Hill would also become team owners later down the line, but when you think of people who had their own teams where they were also the drivers, it's those three. Gurney had a team called the All-American Racers, because they were, well, All-American. It was set up by Gurney and Carroll Shelby in Santa Ana, California in 1964, which was where they ran the American sports car and Indian car racing projects. But when the team was in Formula 1, they were rebranded the Anglo-American Racers, because you can't call yourselves All-American when your headquarters is in Sussex. The car they had in Formula 1 was called the Eagle, and it had a Westlake V12 in the back. Well, eventually it had a Westlake V12 in the back, but ran a four-cylinder Climax engine to start with. Again, can't call yourself All-American with that stuff in it. Gurney had also changed the name to Anglo-American Racers to give credit to the people on this side of the Atlantic that were building the car, and it has to be one of the best-looking cars of the period, especially with that beak on the front. The Eagle won just one race in the three seasons that it was in Formula 1. If you look at the Wikipedia entry for the team and see all of the complete Formula 1 results, it's just a sea of purple for not finishing races. Although, on the other side of the Atlantic, Gurney's team was a little bit more successful. In 1968, Bobby Unzer won the Indianapolis 500 in an AAR-built car, and during the 60s and 70s, the AAR cars, or Eagles, whatever you want to call them, won a total of 51 races. In 1973, Gordon Johncock would win the 500, and then Unzer would win another in an Eagle in 1975. And this kind of leads us into the main body of the video. Got to have all the background stuff, otherwise it makes no sense later on. So, USAC, Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala. No, it's the United States Auto Club, which is one of the sanctioning bodies within the United States for motorsport. USAC was set up in 1955 because the AAA, the Automobile Association of America, didn't want anything to do with motorsport because of the disaster at Le Mans and the death of Bill Vukovic that year. So USAC was formed to take over the running of the 500, and today has things like National Sprint Cars, Stadium Super Trucks and other series under its umbrella. USAC was formed by Tony Hallman, who owned the Indianapolis Motor Speedway at that time. The Sports Car Club of America and the National Association for Stock Car Racing, SSCA and NASCAR, were originally in contention to take over, but Hallman managed to get his organisation to do the taking over. Which kind of makes sense, given that the race at Indianapolis is the centrepiece for this kind of racing. God, imagine if IndyCar had a playoff system. I've set the Indy fans off now, haven't I? Ah. Under USAC, a championship called the United States National Championship was run. This is what the NTT IndyCar series is now, although there was a little bit of political juggling between sort of 1996 and 2008. But behind the scenes, Dan Gurney had realised that things weren't quite rosy with their new format. Also in 1978, there was a plane crash when a Piper Navajo Chieftain crashed in a thunderstorm near Indianapolis on its way back from the Trenton Speedway in New Jersey. On board were several officials from USAC. Ray Marquette, USAC's Vice President of Public Affairs, Frank Delroy, the Chairman of the USAC Technical Committee, Shim Malone, a starter for USAC Races and the head of the Midget Racing Division, Judy Phillips, Graphic Artist and Publication Director for the USAC Newsletter, Stan Worley, the Chief Registrar, 
Ross Teagarden, I think that's how it's pronounced, the assistant technical chairman, Don Peabody, the head of the sprint division, Dr. Bruce White, the assistant staff doctor, and Don Mullendore, the pilot. And Tony Hallman, the owner of IMS, had died earlier that year, and were only in the April of 1978. And all this had happened in that same time period that Gurney was looking for something to change about racing in the US. While the plane crash and death of Hallman had all happened in one go near enough, he'd been looking at things for at least three years prior, and had been talking to other team owners about it. He knew something wasn't right and had to change, and with everything up in the air at USAC, it seemed right to do it now. Gurney had found that a few of his fellow team owners were not happy with how things were being run. Aside from the Indy 500, attendances were low and the TV rights deals were pitiful. They also felt that the payouts for the 500 were not in line with the prestige of the event, and like I said, all of this was happening years before the plane crash. Some say the plane crash was the excuse, but really it was just an unfortunate coincidence. This was probably going to happen, plane crash or not. The team owners were also quite annoyed that USAC was doing everything in its power within the rulebook to try and make a borderline obsolete Offenhauser engine competitive, despite the Ford DFX, which was basically a turbocharged version of the DFV, being, well, faster, more powerful, and the future. But the real problem was the lack of return on investment, spending a lot of money to race and relying on sponsors and TV revenue to keep the bank balance in check, so that they could carry on racing. In the years leading up to all of this, Gurney was finding it harder and harder to make a living in motorsport with the lack of return, and the other team owners knew it too. Those same team owners had very little, if any, control over the direction of the series. But Gurney knew that the sport had potential. He knew that it could get onto televisions across America and maybe across the entire world, and make the sport healthier so that the teams could carry on racing like they already were. So armed with a pen and a piece of paper, Gurney sat down to write an open letter to the rest of the teams. This became known as the Gurney White Paper. The entire white paper is available online. What I'll do here is paraphrase the best bits and use that to further the story because quoting the entire thing is a cheap way out, and I won't be adding anything by simply reading it to you like some sort of petrol head's bedtime story. But Gurney had said that even just by reaching 10% of the potential, they could tap into it more and more and more and maybe get the maximum from it. And by even the 90s he felt it hadn't, let alone the 70s. The team owners, Gurney included, had been so focused on racing each other they were almost blind to the bigger problems within the sport. They all knew that the financial rewards could be bigger and that they could effectively run their teams as businesses, instead of being businessmen away from the track. He also pointed out that they had the likes of Roger Penske, Pat Patrick and himself as heavy hitters in the sport, and not even they were getting stuff done. And Gurney had something to compare their situation to, Formula One. When the GPDA started getting a foothold into things and Jackie Stewart started leading the charge, they were able to use their collective voice to get the FIA to do stuff at that level within the rulebook and also get the circuit owners to change the tracks so that they were safe, keeping the circuit evolution in line with the car evolution. I mean, he was there. He also pointed out the fact that Formula One had someone at the top managing all those commercial rights. Bernie Eccleston. When the Formula One Constructors Association was formed in 1974, the teams had their voice, and as a result, the amount of money in Formula One from television, sponsors, attendances at races, and general journalistic coverage of the sport increased to the point where the teams and drivers were making way more money than they ever were. Formula One fans were getting way more value for money than the IndyCar fan outside of the 500. Eccleston had turned a ragtag group of teams that turned up and raced into a legitimate business. Gurney knew that IndyCar could be something similar. Okay, not as big because Formula 1 is a worldwide series and not a national one, but the blueprints were there. F1 teams could cover the escalating cost now thanks to the increased revenue. The IndyCar teams needed that same leg up. Part of the white paper said, At the moment, we the car owners are the ones who have put forth by far the most effort by far the most financial stake with little or no chance of return, and yet, because we've been so busy fighting with each other, we have let the track owners or promoters and the sanctioning body lead us around by the nose, while they reap the benefits. USAC, for instance, negotiates with TV as though it had the TV rights, which in fact, if it came to a showdown, would turn out to be ours. Gurney also worked out that over the course of a 500, about 600,000 people would be coming through the gate. 200,000 for the first week of qualifying, 100,000 for the second week of qualifying, and then 300,000 for the race. The organizers of the race could easily put up a $2 million prize purse to be split based off the finishing positions, on top of the TV revenue both in the US and abroad. The teams and drivers did more to build the stands at the Brickyard than anybody else. It should be the Holman family thanking them 
and not the other way around. In addition, the other tracks they visited would need to step up their promotional efforts to excite the fans and draw them in, as well as getting the press to do their thing, TV to do their thing, and then the sponsors could then look to advertise. Gurney knew that they couldn't cut the cost of the actual racing, so they needed to make the revenue streams come from somewhere else, and do it off the back of making the sport popular, and any tracks that couldn't put up a negotiated price purse, they'd get dumped off the calendar. Or they could take another leaf out of Foker's book and have a commercial arm like Foker do all of the promotion on behalf of the circuit for a fee, and then leave USAC to just do the sanctioning of the race and just leave the circuit to host the race and get people through the door. Just like the way that Bernie and the FIA were doing things. Foker, as an example, was promoting the German Grand Prix of 1978 at Hockenheim, while the FIA made sure all the cars fit the rulebook. The next step was to make sure they were all on the same page with regards of how to move it forward. It's at this point in the open letter that Gurney suggested they form a group to make sure all of this can be done. On a whim, he suggested that the group be called Championship Auto Racing Teams. Cart. If he could get everybody in agreement, the next step was to take on the might of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, because they were the ones that can afford the bigger prize purses immediately, and also negotiate their rights as part of the TV deal, rather than Indy's part of the TV deal. I'm assuming that this means the image rights of the drivers and teams. On top of this, an all-out attack on marketing was also considered, essentially creating a ready-to-go press pack so that everything can be sent out as needed, and just, it's there, ready to go. Headshots, team promo pictures, other bits and pieces, so that in the weeks leading up to each race, everybody will know the name Bobby Unza, or Mario Andretti, and so on. Make it so that people want to see these gladiators race. This would hopefully lead into picking up more sponsors that would sponsor events and the teams and do other bits and pieces at an event to sort of create a, um, I don't know what you want to call it, to so make it that everybody gets something out of it. So fuel, whiskey, tobacco, banks, supermarkets, you name it. This then leads into exclusive event sponsors, exclusive series sponsors, and it all adds up in time. So the revenue just keeps going up and up and up and up. It makes the sport healthy. And that's what Gurney wanted. The teams signed up. CART became the union that Gurney intended it to be, but USAC refused to work with them. So the teams all jumped ship at the end of 1978 to start their own series in 1979. In response, USAC tried to ban all the CART teams from the 1979 Indy 500, but the court stepped in and lifted that ban. CART and USAC then somehow managed to settle into a peaceful coexistence, with USAC sanctioning the Indy 500. Basically, the kart teams would race in their series, USAC had its series, and in the middle is the 500. Eventually though, kart would be the national championship and the 500 would be the only race sanctioned by USAC, at least until 1997 when the next split occurred. How all this worked, I don't know. I don't know what the difference was between kart's rules and USAC's rules regarding engines and dimensions of the cars and what they can and can't run. You know, how different was a car at Pocono versus a car at Indianapolis? I mean, someone's going to know. Please let me know. But during the 1980s, the effects of Gurney's ideas were starting to manifest. In 1982, the purse was $2 million, $3 million in 1985, $4 million in 86, $5 million in 88, and $6 million in 89. When Emerson Fittipaldi won that 500, he took a $1 million just for himself. In 1970, the total prize was $1 million. In 2008, the prize pool was $14.5 million. Helio Castroneves pocketed $3 million of that. That was the highest prize pool on offer, apparently. It looks like it's dropped off a tad since then, which raises some concerns. Sort of. I did a video on this last year? This year? About how IndyCar seems to be harming its own development. There was another split in 1996 and reunification in 2008, which probably explains the high prize purses around that time. But when it was reunified, it was no longer in the hands of the teams or a national governing body, but in the hands of the people that own the circuit that is the sports centrepiece. Now it's in the hands of Roger Penske, but even then it seems to be a bit... here and there. I'll leave a card for that video if I remember, but the general gist of it is it's a mixture of like poor promotion, having the whole thing revolve around the Indy 500, and other bits and pieces that just make it a bit rough around the edges. You've got the Indy 500 and then it just seems that everything else is just there, for want of a better word. And the whole thing that one of my friends once said that 
why am I going to tell my mate to pay $10 a month for Peacock to watch the IndyCar if it's going to get interrupted every five minutes with buy this pickup truck? So then, about 45 years later, how has the Gurney white paper held up? Even with the carnage of the split and how IndyCar is now, the sport has implemented most of what he thought of in that open letter. The sport is way better off commercially, but I'd say it still lacks a certain X factor. Maybe it needs another Mansell moment with a very popular Formula 1 driver going the other way, and with social media now a thing, that will amplify things a lot. Imagine if Max Verstappen went over and tried IndyCar, not just the 500, but the whole season, like Mansell did. That would definitely get more eyes and sponsors looking. But I guess that's the issue with the two sports, Formula 1 and IndyCar that is. One is an international sport that goes all over the world, while IndyCar is and will always be, at its core, a national one. But that's something that people who know more than me will be able to expand on in the comments. GP Laps, David Land, they'd know a lot more. So then, a look at the original IndyCar split with Dan Gurney's white paper that led to the formation of CART. If this has taught you something new, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help contribute to the picture purchasing piggy bank, then a link is in the description for Patreon as well as links to Discord, socials and affiliates. All those memberships and super thanks if that tickles your fancy. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.